how good Josh's editing skills are tomorrow. <laughs> but anyhow, in the beginning, it says that, you know, that God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of the Lord moved across the face of the waters. We're in Genesis 1. And it says, and the Lord did what? He said, let there be light. And there was light. So the very thing that we see is even in the beginnings of creation, there was a spoken word. How many of you, I want to hear what your definition of a prophet is. Just shoot a hand up real quick. What's your definition of a prophet? Speaking future things happening. Christy? Speaking the heart and mind of God. A messenger of God. Kimmeth? God's mouthpiece. See, everybody's got an idea, but here's the thing. How many of us understand that it's not just someone that speaks for God, but how about someone that speaks with God? Because it, and we, we've made speaking with God about prayer. It's more than just prayer. It's living in that place where it is revealing the Father's heart. Is speaking what's already in the Father's heart. I love the fact that we see John, the beloved disciple. He understood every time Jesus sat down, this disciple ran over and threw his head on Jesus' chest. Because it says that he wanted the heart, you know, it said that he just would put his head on his chest. And everybody around there must have thought that was pretty weird. Because most of the time back then, you really didn't see men embracing. You know, you don't, you do, even, even in today's culture, we don't necessarily see a man sitting down and another man coming, running up real quick and throwing his head on his chest and refusing to move to the point where it was actually recorded in scripture that that was how he liked to sit. Why? Because he understood that if he could catch the heartbeat of heaven, he would always know the pulse from the throne. We have to be ready to recognize God's pulse in everything. Um, one of the, I'm really excited about the books that we're going to be receiving but guess what? The only book that you need to start with is right here, is the Word of God. The reason you're not getting your books right away is this. I don't want you to understand this is the first place you go, and this should be the last place you go. Every other book becomes a guideline. One of the things about this prophetic class is not the thing. I'm not here going to tell you I'm going to teach you to prophesy. You already know how to prophesy. We're just going to push you into it. And people say, oh, I don't know about that. Well, here's what I do know, that God speaks. His voice is inside you. It says that if with the minute he became your Lord, he said, I and the Father will come and make our abode with you. That means that you're a God house. That means that you have everything that God has in him, and he is a speaking God. When he came in, when he released himself into creation, the very first thing that is recorded that he did was speak. So that means that the God that spoke everything into existence is now living on the inside of you. That means that you've just got to learn how to become the mouthpiece of God. I like that. That we've got to understand that God wants to speak. Amos 3 says it this way. It's Amos 3, 7. It says that God doth nothing except he first tell his prophets. The reason he does that is because he has to have a voice in the earth. You know, heavens belongs to the Lord, but the earth he's given under the children of men. So that means that if it's under our dominion, our, our domain, it was given for us to rule, then that means that we have to understand, and we always tend to go back to Genesis because one of the greatest things about kingdom is taking us back to creative value to our original purposes and plans that God ever had for man, and that was how he was to rule the, the world that we now see. The same way that God rules and reigns in heaven is the way that he created man to rule with him in the earth. God never intended man to walk independently of God. He never created us just to release us and let us do our own thing. We were created by, by his design for his purposes and his plans. That's why a lot of times if you follow me around, you'll see I bury you guys in Genesis. Because the very first thing that man did when he was created, that God, it says that he reached into the dust and he formed a man, and God breathed into the nostrils of man and he became a living soul. So the very first thing that formed man's first breath was the exhaling of God's breath. Do you understand the prophetic in that? That means that God breathed into man and man breathed out God. So it wasn't the very first breath that man ever breathed didn't even belong to him. It belonged to God. Prophecy is when you begin to breathe the breath of God wrapped around words. That's what you're doing. That's what we're coming in here to do. When you, what you speak is what you're going to see. 
The bottom line is if you don't say it, it's not going to happen. All the wishful thinking, all that good thoughts. Listen, a good thought might be one thing, but until it becomes a God speak through you, you're never going to see it. People say, oh, well, I see this and I see that, but here's the difference. Certain things are released into nature. If you plant a seed, the seed contains everything in it in the right environment to produce. A God word in your mouth is the right environment. As soon as it's spoken and goes into the atmosphere that God's created, it will produce. So that means that if we speak negatively all the time, we're going to have that. If we speak positively all the time, we're going to have that. But it's more than just speaking positive things. It's speaking God things. It's not about a good thing it's, or, or a bad thing. It's about a world thing, a flesh thing versus a God thing. We've got to understand that the God things that he wants in our mouth and in our life, it's our responsibility to steward our words. Every word you speak speak is like a seed. And go with me real quick. We're going to run, we're going to run a lot of scripture. We're going to go to a lot of different places. One of the things I'm going to tell you is I'm not an, about end time prophetics. We will be touching on them, but listen, the bottom line is this. I'm more, the end times are, one, are, are fine, but I'm more interested right now in a now time. We've got to learn what to say now. We've got to learn what we're going to do right now. How many of you need to know more about tomorrow than 10 years from now? And the reason I'm asking for hands is this, because most of us have, God might give us those, those visions and goals. When we go before the Father and God begins to show us long term, here's what he shows you. He'll show you mountain peaks you will see up here. He gives you glimpses of glory, but he never shows you the steps that you might have to go to to get to that next peak. So see, the problem is with most of us is we don't wait from peak to peak. We have to go peak, then we walk, then we peak again. Here's what God wants. God wants every step that's ordained by him to be revealed by him. And he's going to do it every day. He's going to speak to you and you're rising up and you're going to bed. How many of you, by a show of hands, walked in here tonight with a notebook and something to take notes? How many of you didn't? Well, did you notice that you got a book handed to you? Part of being prophetic is being prepared. You always have to be ready to be used by God. See, God's had us sing stuff we'll never say. That's why when we begin to sing, use me, God, mold me, God, shape me, God, we begin to talk about be the fire down inside of me, be the flame in my heart. There's so many songs that we're singing because we're prophetically singing what we won't prophetically say. So God is preparing us and shaping us even through worship by teaching us how to frame words that create and don't just communicate. So when we go with the scripture, I want, there's so many places I want to start, but go with me to Genesis 1 first. I'm so excited about this. How many of you are really excited to find out neat things in the word of God? Because I'm telling you what, I came from the old school where the sword challenge was the thing. And we all know the scriptures, and, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to begin to read the, the word with a prophetic eye. Because when God was talking about let there be light, and there was light, and here's the thing, and when God saw the light, that it was good, and then here's what I want you to notice. We begin to read it. When God began to speak, things moved. When you begin to speak, things will move. We've talked about things, but we've stopped talking to them. We've done a whole lot of explaining and a whole lot of complaining. We were never called to explain or complain. We were called to create. We were called to notice things. One of the greatest things about being a prophet is that you're going to get your senses sharpened. I'm looking around this room and I see people with such a prophetic unction over their life because you notice things that other people don't. If you go into a room, are you a noticer? If I ask you who had on what? where something was located. You might have only been there one time, and I'll say, where's the bathroom? And you're, you might have been there one time, and you'll say, what's down there and to the left? Because you're a noticer. That's part of your prophetic gifting, is that you see things quickly that other people don't see. How many of you are hearers? You notice sounds. See, that's prophetic. There's a sharpening of the ear. There's a direct correlation between the eye gate, the ear gate, and the heart gate. See, the thing is, we're going to find out how to identify whether our gates are open or closed. 
We're going to identify what we're seeing, whether we're seeing what we need to see through the eyes of kingdom, through the eyes of flesh, and even through the eyes of others. Because too many times we let other people shape our perspective. And if we take someone else's opinion before God's, we'll never speak God's word into that situation. So God's really going to hone what we speak, what we receive, what we hear, because there is a correlation. Because what a man sees, he'll process. He'll begin to think on it. Everything that you hear. See, your heart. It says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. There is an 18-inch transfer that happens from the top of your head to the bottom of your heart, and from the bottom of your heart to the top of your head. And the bottom line is this. Until your heart's right, your mouth won't be right. So we've got to understand that in this time, in this place, that we are being shaped into a prophetic people. We're going to be pushed. We're going to be challenged. We're going to activate. We're going to see scripture in a new light. The reason I'm taking you back to Genesis is this. The beginning of things are important. You, the, you know, every, every house that's ever built starts with a plan. Nobody just walks out and starts throwing a bunch of lumber together. So the thing is, is, is even as a prophetic people, when God was beginning, for, when we beginning to call forth even into creation, he created the environment that he put man in. Even before man spoke a single prophetic word, the environment that he was going to speak those words in were already created. That's, God wants you to create prophetic environments, that his word becomes a seed that will go in and create in a creative environment. The minute that God wants to give you a word, see, God will give you a word about someone's now, or he'll give you a word about their past that you have to hook to their now that you can show them their next. That's the problem with a lot of prophecy that starts. Have, how many of you had a wrong word? I mean, they're so off. They've come to you and it has just been, they meant well, or they, but it's been off. Because here's what a lot of prophets will do. And I'm not going to, we'll, we'll go into some of the gifts, but here's the thing. I'm never ever about the false of a thing. Because that before you have to have a counterfeit, they always go and look at the real. They've never made a fake purse from a fake purse. They've never, <laughs> seriously, they've never made a fake piece of art off a fake piece of art. They always go off of an original. So the best thing that we can do is understand that anything that's counterfeit is something that comes off of the original. So we've got to go and look at what we're to be doing because we don't want to be off. I see a lot of people come up with information but no revelation. And all it does is bring back guilt, shame. If somebody's got to reach in the blood to pull something out of your past to get your attention and they never put you in the now and push you into your next, I want you to take that piece of prophecy, shelf it, and don't do anything with it. Don't let it linger in your heart. Don't let it go into your mind. I see too much of it in the body of Christ right now that people are not, they're communicating, but they're not creating. If all I ever did was walk up to somebody who used to be stuck into drug addiction and talk to them about their addiction, and you know what? It'll touch a place in their heart, and I may get their attention, but here's what God wants to do. God wants to get their attention to push them into their destiny. So he may give them a word about your a past, but they're not going to bury you in your past. If somebody's got to go in the sea of forgetfulness, they'll drown you before they get you into that. See, I see, I see too many people coming to me. They're like, Sister Lisa, can you help me? Prophet, can you help me? The problem line is, is that they've listened to a wrong voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and the wrong voice, they'll not hear. We've got to tune our ears to what's God and what's not God. Satan does not come in as darkness with horns sticking up and a pitchfork saying, hi, I'm the devil, and I'm going to whisper to you today. He comes in as an angel of light, as a deceiver. He comes in looking like things that are bright when really all he's doing is putting Pushing you into darkness. This, listen, confusion is not of God. God is not the author of confusion. If you have a prophetic word show up and it doesn't bring light that's good, guess what? It didn't come from God. You have to know the source. It's like having a lamp plugged in. If you want to find out where the source of the power is, guess what? You, it's not ever about the bulb. It's not about how many clicks it is or how many watts the bulb is. You have to go and you have to find the power source to where it's plugged in. Let prophecy be like that. Find the light and trace it back to the source. And you'll know which, whether it's from God or whether it's not from God. Most people don't set out to give you a false prophecy. And that's another thing. We're going to go into that. We'll talk about why people are moved. They hear from God, but it's not enough to hear from God. You have to do with God. We'll see people that want to speak out in tongues and, and, and prophesy through the church. There's a time. God is a God of order. 
You will never have a free-for-all with everybody. And listen, there's times where it could get very exciting and people prophesying and saying things. It will never be to the point where it's just chaos. God does not move in chaos. He is a God of order. We do things decently in order. We're going to actually deal with the gifts of the Spirit, where it talks about the nine gifts of the Spirit. We're going to go into the three that let you walk like God, the three that let you talk like God, and the three that let you speak like God. You're gonna, we're going to delve into the gifts. We're going to talk about the opportunity operations of those gifts. We're going to get in 1 Corinthians 12, and we're going to go through 1 Corinthians 14, which is the operation. But here's the thing. What's 1 Corinthians 13 on my Bible scholars? The love chapter. Every gift that we do should be motivated by love. Every word that you speak should be motivated by love. It should be the love of the Father, and because the Father loves people, you better love people. The one thing I'm going to say, prophets, is this. It starts in prayer. If you don't pray, you won't have anything to say. Because how will you know his voice if you spend no time with him? If you show me a prophet and you don't have a prophet life, then I know you don't have a prayer life. Nobody's going to walk up to you talking to you about what thus says the Lord thy God. You'll know it's off from the minute they start talking if they don't have a prayer life. Because how will you know him unless you spend time with him? And the bottom line is, Revelations 19 and 10 it says that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. If it does not point you to your king and does not point you to Jesus Christ, it is not prophecy. It is something else. That's what prophets are for. They are to usher the way to the king. You have to understand that we are called to usher the way to the king. It is not about us. It is not about titles. Listen, titles are fine, but function is better. We are all about function here. We are going to learn to unction and function in that unction. An unction is the anointing. The anointing has been misrepresented, has been misunderstood. We're going to delve into the differences in the anointing because without the anointing, the yoke will never be destroyed. Prophets move in the anointing. There's so much that we have to go and delve into. How many of you are still in Genesis 1? Don't you love a beginning? I absolutely love this. Go with me to verse 28. Part of the blessing that God said to you is be fruitful, multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. I want to tell you something. In the very blessing that God gave you, there is a, the release of dominion and power. God not only gave you the power, he gave you the authority to use that power. I'm not going to bury you in the Old Testament simply because Jesus Christ, we're going to go into the New Testament prophets. How many of you have been taught New Testament prophecy? I see two, three hands, four hands, five hands. Because most of the time we get you down in those Old Testament prophets and we stick you there. But can I tell you, they are a basis, a foundation. Everything that you see, the school of the prophets, the reason we call this the prophet school and the school of the prophets is actually out of First Samuel because Samuel began, he was a prophet in Israel. There was no open vision. The people were perishing because there was no one that heard from God. Can I tell you there are people around you today that are dying that have not heard from God. And by the time we see Elisha come onto the scene in the school of prophets and the, them building even a bigger place because the place that they live is so straight. That means it was tight. They were packed in. I, I'm telling you, we're getting ready to see a church packed in with the prophets of God. Because that's what needed is the God speakers. See, the thing is, we've been God chasers, but we haven't been God speakers. We've ran after him. We've run. We've won. God says, no, be a God speaker. Find my words in your mouth. And I'm going to set you in situations where you're going to speak my word. And you're going to create with me and change. You're going to take dominion. See, we've come back into the place where when we find out who our identity is and our authority is, and then we find out that our gifts and our callings that were always created in us. See, the thing of you, a lot of you here, the very thing that's always been wrong with you is the thing that's been right with you. When you were little and they told you, shut up, you talk too much. It's because there was, an un there was a gift buried inside of me. And listen, if I was alone, I was talking. I was always talking and singing and making noise. It's who I was. 
And everybody used to be like, can't sh just shh, 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 shh. And then the more they'd shh, the more louder I'd talk or the louder I'd sing or I'd have to be whispering, always have to be doing something. I was always busy. See, the thing about it is, is that was part of my unique makeup because God had created me for a purpose and a design. I'm looking at some people in here with some gifts and talents that you don't even know about. We're going to find those gifts and talents. There's some of you that when you were little, you had to take everything apart. Let me see your hands. Had to see how it worked. See, I was one of them too. I got a bike for Christmas that they spent all night putting together. That next morning, I got up, flipped it over, took it apart. My mom said we should have just handed her the box. But we have to know how things work and how things operate. That is a prophetic gifting in you. That's a revelatory gift. How does it work, God? How? That means that you want the revelation of how something goes together. That is one of the prophetic gifts. That's how words of wisdom and words of knowledge begin to work together. See, you're seeking revelation. There is so much that we're going to go through and we're going to delve into. I'm, I'm so excited for us to take it apart because the thing that God has showed me and impressed on me the most for this prophet school is that we begin to push one another in the right direction. We begin to create together because see, if one can put a thousand to flight and two can put 10,000 to flight, how much more can we do together when we come together in unity and begin to be, God gave me convergence. And there was a word that came forth from Bruce. He said confluence and everybody began to talk about it. And if you understand that tributaries, they start out mighty rivers don't start as a mighty river they start as streams and trickles that all go towards one place in Psalm 133 you see that brethren that dwell together in unity it talks a little bit further not just about the oil but it likens it under the dew on Mount Hermon that drops down and it becomes the Jordan River you have to understand there's a type of anointing the first one drops down from heaven and the other one is bubbling up we're gonna get into that later and let me tell tell you something, you're going to understand what's the difference between what God's dropping down and what the Spirit's bubbling up, but it creates a flow. It creates a convergence that you can go into, and it will begin to water dry places, the places that are dead. That's what it is when we get together and we begin to pull on each other's anointing and say, let me flow with you, and you flow with me. We become the unstoppable creative force of the Most High God that we begin to release creation again. Man was created to release creation and we have left go of what we were created and designed to do we get mad and the very first thing we do is I'm not talking to her don't you see the enemy in that because if he can shut us up he can stop us because if I refuse to talk with you and I refuse to walk with you, how can I pray with you? How can I encourage you? How can you encourage me? Acts 20 and 32 says there is an inheritance in the saints of God. There is a prophetic gift in you that I need. I have a prophetic gift in me that you need. And together the body of Christ will rise up and look like the bride we're supposed to be. We will be found expecting when he comes. We will be doing what God has called us to do. Full of the Spirit of God, releasing the Spirit of God. It is about Christ and His kingdom. We were called to occupy, not lay down and be run over. Woo, and I got to teach, not preach. I'm sorry. I wheel it back. <laughs> so remind me, you know, just, but we're going to find out about God prompts. How many of you know what you're called to do? Okay. I see a few head nods. Because here's why. We, we're so unsure of our purpose. Have you ever seen those games where they show you something and ask you what it is? I feel like when we look into a glass, that's how we look into the glass darkly. It says that we look into the glass, and when we walk away from the glass, we forget what manner of man we are. See, prophecy becomes like a mirror. When somebody gets, well, ha, comes to you with a prophetic word, God has already shown them what's inside of you and they begin to look at the God in you and begin to call out the God gifts and the God talents and the things that God buried in you and he they begin to pull on them see we don't recognize the power of words because prophetic words can create and prophetic words can destroy we're gonna we're gonna skip around a whole lot go with me to Jeremiah 1 
See, when I talk about being created on purpose for a purpose, we were created by design for a purpose. I love this. And he says in him, to verse 4, it says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. We have to understand the word always comes saying something. God, God, we have a God that not only says but sings. Zephaniah says he's the God that sings over us. You know what? How many of you need a song from God sung over you? Come on. Because we've got a God that when we sing to him, begins to sing back to us. I want to catch some God songs. There's some God singers in this house. We want to release the God songs. We want to release the God sounds. We want to catch what God is doing. Because the thing about it is, is when we begin to worship him and tell him who he is, he shows us who we are. When we say, God, you're awesome, you're mighty, you're glorious. He said, you're my child, you're my darling, you're the apple of my eye. He begins to tell you that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. He not only tells you, but then he says why you're where you are. A lot of you wonder, why have I come to this place in life? It's because God designed you for right now. This is the right place at the right time. God has positioned you to do the great things, the incredible things. Don't think it's just by Daniel's chance that it says that the, the people of God that know their God shall do mighty exploits. You were created to do mighty exploits, and it starts prophetically. Mighty things don't start one day you find yourself in the middle of a mighty thing. It's because you have allowed the mighty words of a mighty God to shape your life and form your speech, to form the way you create. We've got to learn to release what we've caught. It's not enough for us to hear from God. I love Jim Painter, and you know what? That was amazing, the word she gave when she said about a first. And she was talking about acceleration, and she hit it right on the head. But she said the very most important thing about being a prophet is hearing from God. That's one of the most important things, not the important thing. Because if you're a hearer and not a doer, what good did it do you to hear? That's the problem with the body of Christ. We've become a whole bunch of hearers and not a lot of doers. And when the prophets do nothing but hear, guess what happens? We get dull. It says you've gotten dull of hearing. That means because all of a sudden it, what should have sharpened you up and drawn you to attention just becomes a lullaby because you've heard it so much. Ask any one of us moms around here. We have a kid. We can be holding a full conversation, and this child's going, mommy, 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 mama, 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 and I'm doing, I'm talking on the phone, going on, because why? As important as that may be, I'm not responding because I've learned to tune it out. And that's what the problem has been in the body of Christ is that God has been talking so much that we've refused to listen or we've been like, oh, well, did you hear that? That was wonderful. And we've hung out around what we've heard instead of doing what God's told us to do. It is so important for us to, to grab and release in this house the spirit of doing because we have incredible hearers around here. We've got people hearing from God all the time. We've got people seeing from God all the time. We've got people that are doing the incredible. They're doing kingdom incredible things, but we've got a whole lot of people that are just sitting down hearing from God. They're wanting to just hear from God. I'm going to release the now what anointing in this house. Now what? You've heard a word. Now what? What are you going to do with what you've heard? When God shows you the cornfield and he begins to talk to you about walking into the place of a harvest and decreeing and declaring, will you just sit and admire the corn and say, you know, God, I don't really want to get my feet muddy or my shoes wet. And I'll just stand here. Can I tell you that if you're not 100% obedient, you're disobedient? If God shows you a set place and a set time with set people, you better find the time and find the place and find the people. See, a lot of us have gotten spiritually lazy. We enjoy it. We're like, woo, Holy Ghost, God, this is amazing. And then we go home and we've gotten divine instructions the whole way across this altar and only half of us are doing it. We have to all be doing it. If you're a prophet in this house and God has called you to speak, God's called you to hear. If you're here tonight, you're not only a hearer but a doer. Because the fact that you showed up 
and you're investing in yourself and in your time to get the word of God deep inside of you, it shows that you were created not just on a purpose, for a purpose. Go with me to verse 9. See, he formed you, he said, in the, in the womb. He sanctified you. I ordained thee to, as a prophet unto the nations. Do I have a national prophet in here? I could look at a couple. Who in here is a prophet to the nations and knows it? I knew it the minute I was called that I was called to speak in the nations. And it took 20 years before my foot started hitting foreign soil. Why? I wasn't obedient. If you're called to speak to the nation, even this one, how many of you know that you're called to speak over this nation? Get ready. Because you're not just a hearer, but a doer. That means that God is going to send some of you on prophetic journeys. God is going to send you to certain places to do certain things. You don't have to understand everything God's going to call you to do. You just have to do it. So you don't under, have to understand God to obey God. There's been times God told me to do some pretty wild things. Preach with my shoes off. It's not because my shoes are tight and not because they tore up. They're cute. But let me tell you why I do it. Because I came up into a place where God said that everywhere that his presence is, is holy. And when Moses encountered the burning bush... That bush that had a fire in it that wasn't consumed. He said, take off your shoes for the place where I am is holy. So if all I have to do is slide off my shoes to create the place of his presence and say, God, I want your holy presence right here. And there'll be nothing between you and me. That's man-made. God made my feet, but he didn't make my shoes. That last supper, he called the disciples to him. What did he wash? Just their feet. That was prophetic. They had already been clean. The only place that ever touched anything of this world and its systems were the feet that walked over top of it. That's why I didn't have to wash their head. They were already clean. Their mind was already with Christ. He breathed on them. Receive you the Spirit. He was creating the place for a new covenant atmosphere of the creative to come back to the people that had forgotten what it was like to create. They'd become watchers and hearers and waiters but they quit being doers. God's calling a people that's going to start being the doers. And he's going to equip them like never before. God says in this place, he touched his hand to his mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy, to throw down and then to build and to plant. Do you realize in that moment, he didn't, he wasn't, he was just found in the presence of God. He was found in a place where Israel had already went astray. There was things that were getting ready to happen, captivities. The, the people were out of position, but God was speaking to him. He said, I formed you. I created you. It's going to start right here and right now. It started with a word that God placed into him, and he began to bring it forth. Do you understand every single thing in this book is prophecy? God spoke, and it happened. This word was formed by prophecy. You're formed by a prophetic word. You were released in heaven before you ever came into the earth. God knew you and formed you. You were created on purpose for a purpose. Go with me to the New... We're going to go into the New Testament. I want to go into... Let's go to Acts 2. I could just keep going. We could just be here for hours and hours and hours. I'm just trying to lay a little foundation. It's going to be really good, and it's going to get really exciting. But the reason I want to go to Acts 2 is because I want to show you something that was wrote, and then hundreds of years later, four or 500 years later, came to pass. Go with me to verse 17. These people that have been looking and hearing and watching but not doing, when it did come, didn't recognize it and had to be reminded that it had already been prophesied. 
And it said, And that shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And upon my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall what? prophesy and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved do you understand that every word that is ever prophesied every sign will point you to the king and to the savior even in those they had been waiting and watching and when the day came that it arrived, they missed it. I don't ever want to miss what God's doing because I'm so caught up watching signs instead of making signs, instead of, instead of being signs. We're not just called to sign and wonder. You know, Jesse Duplantis years ago had this cute tape out. He said, God's not a deaf mute. He does more than sign and wonder. I thought, wow. And it took me a long time because at first when I heard that, I was like, that's a little offensive. I thought that was a little facetious and sarcastic. And then I began to look into that. And you know what the problem is? Is because we've kept God silent except in certain areas. If it didn't move the way we thought it ought to move, then we didn't receive it. Let me tell you something. I am the worst person for having to be beat on the head by the Holy Spirit. You see me now, real obedient. That's because I've been knocked down so much by the Holy Ghost. And when I tell you knocked down, it's that when you get home and you're going, oh, Jesus, and you can't sleep for days at a time because you know you've missed it. And your divine Kairos opportunity came and you refused to walk into it. And so God had to send someone else because you said no. You said yes with your lips, but no with your actions. Oh, yes, God, I'll do what you tell me to do. But send me, send me, send me. And when the opportunity came to be sent, I wouldn't walk across the street and share Jesus with somebody because I didn't want to waste my time. Let's tell the truth. I knew dinner was at five. Husband was coming home. I had to get home. I had the kids. And here's this woman in a wheelchair that needs healing. And I couldn't go out of my way to give her a prophetic word and speak to the crippled leg and the back that was bent and the arms that were too weak to be lifted up. Listen, if I'd have took my time, God would have delivered her on the spot. I've learned that if I'm in giant, let there be a line. Let my dinner burn. Let my kids be late. Somebody, listen, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to make God the priority and not the option. That's what prophets do. He, they, he becomes the priority. Because listen, that voice will poke you and the Holy Ghost will thump your heart and all of a sudden nothing will go right. Why? Because God's going to pull you and put you back into position until it does go right, till you become obedient to Christ. People don't want to hear that God will do that to you. I've got the God that was the God that reached down into Ezekiel's hair, lifted him up, put him halfway between heaven and earth, and started showing him something. So if God's got to pull your hair to get your attention, you better believe God can pull your hair and get your attention. See, even the call of the disciples was prophetic. He looked at the disciples, and Andrew said, here's who we've been waiting on. He ran and got Peter. They'd been waiting. That's what I think is amazing. He began to talk to them and call. Even the call of the disciples is prophetic. Christ's birth was prophetic. You could take, if you could get a Jewish person to read the Gospels, they'd get saved. Because they would realize that in those little handfuls of scriptures through the Gospels, it revealed everything for thousands of years that they've been waiting on. Can I tell you that for thousands of years there's been a word that's been waiting to be released and God had it birthed inside of you. So if you're not willing to speak it, then we are not willing to have, God, God that will have to wait. See, there's words inside of you that if you just spoke 10 years ago, things would be shaped different. Some of you is like, well, I don't know about that. I know. There's some of you that if you'd have ever learned how to call four things out of your children, they wouldn't have had to go listen to anybody else's voice. They'd have listened to yours. They'd have listened to God through you. See, I had to learn all that. I learned the hard way. I had, I had the boy that, you know, that I would sow into and sow into. And he understands and he recognizes the prophetic. It's not enough for you to come in and just enjoy a prophetic atmosphere, get a tickle and a goose bump and leave. Every word that you hear from the mouth of God is to shape something inside of you that can be released to change someone's eternity. 
You have eternal words inside of you. Prophetic words are eternal words. And I love what Pastor said about practicing. Guess what? We've got to learn to speak. A baby does not come up speaking to you like he just wrote war and peace. You know, a baby's not going to come up, thus is the Lord thy God, in the day that Mo- They're not going to talk like that. They're going to come up and say, Mommy, look, angels. Mommy, God, you know, here's what most, here's what, how I love what my little granddaughter says to me. Look, Jesus. She shows me things and tells me they're Jesus. The tree is Jesus. The flower is Jesus. And she'll show me little things. One night Christy was here with us. Dave Hogan was here. And we were walking around, and he was walking around praying. And every time she, she was laughing, every time she looked at him. And on the cameras, as they would come in and out, Jody was preaching that night, but David would come up behind Jody, and the camera would catch him a little bit, and then he'd duck back. Because David does a whole lot of this stuff, you know? And he just kind of moves a little bit, and he'll rock on his heels. Well, when he'd rock forward, he'd be in camera, and he'd go backwards. And she'd say, look, see Jesus. So God gave her eyes that recognize when Jesus is present. There's certain people that she certainly responds to. They're a stranger. She doesn't know them, and she's a child that's very leery, but there's certain people that she just absolutely clings to, and she loves them and will hang out with them because there's something about the presence of God in them, and she's so drawn to it. That's why people are drawn to you because the living God has put a living word inside of you. God didn't create you. When he says that we're living letters, read and known of all men, it's because there's a living word inside of you. We're going to start releasing those living words. How many of you have always had, how many of you know that you get prophetic words? How many of you wake up? It doesn't matter when you look at the clock, it's triple numbers. I call them the God prompts. We're going to talk about the ways that you hear from God. See, I'm going dead. See what I do to these things? I'm telling you. Okay, what you hearing from God right now? What you hearing? I'm looking around the room and I'm asking you what you're I'm going to break this. Dear Jesus. I feel like Dumbo if I only had wings, you know. Ever seen an elephant fly? See, I'm going to tell you something. We're going to learn how to hear from God in new ways. We're going to learn um, what it looks like. Because see those numbers? I call them God prompts. Got an email from a pastor today. He says, I keep seeing 1111. 1111. Who's getting 1111s in here? You know what 11 means? How many of you know? Don't know? Is it strength? 10 plus 1? Okay. I actually, see, and here's one of the great things that you're going to have is if you do a study in the Bible, you just said it. It was talking about 11. 11 is one shy of 12. We have a whole lot about 12, but very little about 11. In the times that we find 11, normally, it's when we see that Judas is no longer there and there's Matthias and they understand that there's a gap. 11 normally means discord and judgment. So that means that if you're coming into something that's out of alignment and you're getting ready to bring judgment to it, how do you bring judgment to it? It's not by what you think, it's by what? What you say. 
So that means that you're going to look at something that's out of line and you're going to call it into alignment. So you've got to understand what prophetic really means. Everything is prophetic to a prophet. Ordinary things become very important. See, fishes and loaves take on a whole new meaning. I want to show you something. Can you zoom in on this quick? That's a little bottle of what? No, look closer. Ketchup. It's a little bottle of Heinz ketchup. What does that say to you? Say it slow. Say it slower. There's a ketchup anointing in this bottle. Because we think we've been so out in the front, but we really need to catch up. Ordinary things are going to start taking amazing meanings onto you. Eric, you were the one that gave Pastor the rubber band? Can you stand up here real quick and share that? Um, when I first started coming to the church, we were just talking about some things, and I, I had a, a huge rubber band. I think it was maybe two feet. And I gave it to the pastor, and he was a little offended because he thought I was saying he was large. And I said, no, the pastor, rubber bands are no good unless they're stretched. They're of no use until you stretch them. I'm getting ready to tell you you're getting ready to be stretched in here. This is why you've showed up. Things that you look at yesterday as ordinary are getting ready to be extraordinary. See, when Jesus encountered a fig leaf... It led the tree. See, he went in and parted the leaves and he began to look for what was called Tosk. He was on his way. It was a place called Bethpage. And it said that as he walked by, they had come out of the temple. They was headed up, going to Martha and Mary's house, a place he liked to hang out. Even in the middle of a place that's comfortable, God was getting ready to see something unusual. It said he parted the leaves and he began to look for a sign of fruit. And because there was no evidence that that tree would produce that year, he cursed it. And the disciples didn't pay much attention to what he said at the time. But the next day, as they walked by again, he said, Master, look, see that tree that you cursed? Because his words were, never shall man eat from you again. Cursed are you. All of a sudden, all they did was go, ooh and ah, around the sign and the wonder. You're to create the signs and wonders. We're not to follow the signs. The signs are to follow us. And these signs shall follow them that believe. We're not looking to go hang around. You know what a sign is? A signpost pointing to Jesus. Everything that you get from, the, from God is, becomes a signpost pointing to Jesus. And the problem is, is the body of Christ is hung around the sign, and that's why they're not getting anywhere. They're not going in the direction that the sign is pointing. They're just hanging around the sign. It's time for us to start going in the right direction. We need to catch up. Some of you are going to be able to look at normal things and see them unusual. Been around a lot of company of prophets lately. A convergence, if you will, of prophets in, in this part of Pennsylvania. If you've done any research about Pennsylvania, you're going to find that this is a cornerstone state. It's a keystone state. When you understand what a keystone is, it is a place they build. It's not the capstone, but the keystone. That means that that stone that's set in position that other stones are conjoined and connected to that are built in a straight line. You're going to understand definitions. You're here. You're not going to start speaking words that you don't know what they mean. You're going to understand that the words that you speak, they're spirit and they're life. And you're going to realize that dead words have no place in the body of Christ. We've got to stop speaking dead words over each other and start speaking living words over each other. Let me tell you something. I got blessed. There was a mom, woman named Mama Jenkson, Jenkins. Did any of you ever see her when she was here? She was a contemporary and protege of Smith Wigglesworth. When she was a little girl, she was a black lady. And she lived to be 106 years old. Before she departed, she imparted. People couldn't get what she was saying, and they'd think this woman was off her rocker. 
But if you ever study anything about Smith Wigglesworth, he was a rough-talking man. There were some things, if you read the history of his life, he would, his wife Polly was a general with the Salvation Army, and she would pray for him to get saved, and he was a drunkard and a plumber, and he'd lock her outside in the snow. She'd get up when he not opened the door the next morning, go in and make him breakfast. Why? Because she understood that a prophetic act was greater than the condemnation of her mouth. She knew who she was in Christ and nothing he did swayed her, but everything that she did changed him. You're going to learn that what you do and what you say can prophetically change people, atmospheres, everything. Listen, you are what you say you are. If you know your identity, somebody can come up to you and tell you if you're George and they tell you you're Tom, you'll say, nope, I'm George. I know who I am. See, that's the way it is in Christ. You're going to be unshakable. You're going to know who you are. You're going to know your purpose. Purpose. You're going to know the plan that God has for you. That's why when people come up to you and say, does it really take all that? You're going to say, yes, it takes all that and a whole lot more because you're going to have authority. You're going to have confidence. I'm telling you right now, I had to pray 10 years to watch my husband come into purpose. My husband went from a dope dealer. Well, he wasn't a dealer. He bought from the dealers. But he was doing an uh, eight ball of cocaine a day. I don't know if any of you know what that is, but that's expensive and enough to destroy any family. He went from that to now he's a preacher ministering and walking in the things of God. But did it happen overnight? No, it was process. And if I'd have stopped in the middle of process and not begun to thank God and put my praise and put the scriptures forth, I'd have kept him buried in where his family said he was. No good. You'll never amount to anything. But let me tell you what God did. God hooked him up with a crazy woman who got saved. My, well, you want to hear something funny? I was literally, our date was to a tent revival. What's up with that? What did he think would happen? I'm in there rolling my eyes like, watch, here these people. We get in the back. We're sitting in the back. And I'm like, yep, he must not have had no money to take me nowhere. This is the best he could do. I had an attitude. It was hot bugs. It was July. I will never forget it. July 4th. Who takes somebody to a July 4th camp meeting? But see, I didn't know I was getting involved with High Dave. And not this kind, but that kind. He was the life of the party, man. So we're sitting there, and I was cute back then and little. I didn't, you know, could sit on one of them little chairs a long time. Didn't hurt. And I mean, these people, these ladies would get out and pray and speak in tongues. And I'm like, they must be Italian. Or Spanish or something. Because, I mean, we come from Nazarene, Southern. I mean, these women was holiness women. I mean, my grandmother was that. My grandmother was a Nazarene. My dad was a Catholic. My grandmother was a Baptist. So I was like a Baptist, Catholic, something or another. So we was soup, right? So I'm watching these people, and these people are having an encounter with God. And there was something that was drawing me. And finally, I quit being aggravated and started listening to what they were saying. And this pastor said that you're not here tonight by accident. Those words have lingered with me. And I had this white, I mean, it was off. I mean, listen, I was skinny enough a jumpsuit looked right. <laughs> I had this white jumpsuit on. And back in the 80s, it had shoulder pads like, poof. I mean, I had some shoulder pads. Amen, mama. And I'm all in white. This is how I was around the prophetic. I'm going to give you some of the things I grew up in and how I came to know that there was a prophet inside of me so you can find out if there's more than just a prophet inside of you. But we're sitting there, and this thing's, and they're, and they're going, and the man says, if you need Jesus, well, now, mind you, I've always been tender. If, if Geraldine and Ricky come, the little puppet, I got saved. If the statesmen come, and I got saved. Near, you know, it didn't matter if they was country gospel, if they sung contemporary gospel. It didn't matter who come. If they sung a song, and, and sung, it, listen, if they sung, if there's room for the cross for you, I made my way to the cross. But I was a prayer prayer, not a life liver. Grew up that way. My Bible, my granny, she was the only one that I can honestly, that woman was hardcore tell you how she got she got saved see don't get back then you didn't get saved in the in the winter she got saved in november they chipped off ice and baptized her then because they told her that if you didn't get baptized you weren't saved 
and they scared them to death. So she was like, I don't care that it's November. Put me in the water. I need to go down. <laughs> she was right. They chipped ice to baptize. I said, that was not only brave on her, but I got a hand, hallelujah, glory to the preacher that got in the water to dunk her. Come on. Woo, Holy Ghost. So I was always like, wait till spring to get saved, <laughs> you know. Wait till June, May, June. Let it warm up a little bit, you know. And as a kid, this is what I saw. I saw people going through these motions and, and being motivated by the turn or burn and fear. So I had always prayed prayers because I didn't want to go to hell. But I sure didn't want to go to heaven either. You know, nobody ever showed me the goodness of God. I didn't know that it was the goodness of God that'll draw them into repentance. Because everybody always told me, you're going to hell. That's all I ever heard. So I believed that. So I was scared. So every time somebody come and sung and put a puppet on a stick, I was getting saved. It was summer camp, hand you a hot dog at the weenie roast, and they're singing, just as I am. Man, praise God. Kumbaya, here I come. <laughs> so this night, I'm in this white jumpsuit, right? I thought I looked so good. I had 80s hair out to here. This bun wasn't tight, it was blowed out. Yeah, I had so much rave hairspray. Some of you women, yep, holla. See, we're telling on ourselves. Had the sun in streak going. I thought I looked good. They start singing. I get up to the front and these holy women of God get around me. And you could, and I mean, have you ever walked into the presence of somebody and knew that they had spent time with God? I couldn't even talk. All I could do was cry. And it was the first time that I had ever had, I was 19 years old, and I had been saved for about two years, and I would play with God in and out. Knew God was calling me. Knew there was a gift and a call in my life. But I never had really responded to the Holy Ghost. But that night, there was something different, and there was in a presence of God, and these women began to prophesy over me. Since she was a little girl, you saw things nobody else saw. That's why the day, and she started, I mean, she read my mail that night, and I'm thinking, somebody's talked to this woman. <laughs> and I mean, have you ever had a word of prophecy so good it'll yank you out of the spirit, and you're like, how did you know that? Amen. Well, we'll talk about that later, but <laughs> anyhow, I was motivated by that, and I came down, and literally, them ladies laid hands on me. That pastor came off that platform right up here on the 94 campground. I can show you where the tent used to be. He laid his hand on me, and I dropped like a ton of bricks. I didn't know where I was. I rolled the floor. I found out what holy roller meant. I'm in a white jumpsuit. I'm crying, and now I'm rolling in dirt. Last time I checked, water and dirt made mud. I had snot. I, had, I, was, oh, I was ruined. I stood up, and I'm a mess. Straw. Back then, they, I don't know why they used to put, like, sawdust and straw down. So, like, I look crazy. I get up, and I am filthy, dirty. My face is filthy, dirty. He said, Are, is it time for you to get clean? And I heard the audible voice of God said, I've made you clean. No more filthy rags. I passed out. The women, my husband of Dave back then was on the back row. He had moved behind the chairs at this point. <laughs> He's watching all this go on. I couldn't talk. I had had an encounter with the Holy Ghost. It pushed me into my purpose. Each and every one of you in this place is going to have an encounter with the Holy Ghost in a new way. I decree it and I declare it in this atmosphere. You will not leave this place the same way you came in. Those of you by line that are watching this, you will have an encounter with the Holy Ghost that will not leave you unchanged. See, when I was little, I'd go to my grandmother, and I'd say, why are they rerunning the news? I saw that already. She'd say, how could you see that? That's the evening news. And I would see helicopters, because when I was a little girl, Vietnam was ending. I'm really telling my age, wow. <laughs> but I would watch the news. You know, my pop, back then, you had three channels, and you were the remote control. <laughs> Get up there and turn that. 
and you didn't touch it. Walter Concrete, the con con what was it, Concrete? Thank you. Yep, I remember him sitting talking, and they would show, and it was the first time that we saw war up close and personal. And they would show these helicopters, and I would tell them, no, I saw that. They're not there. They're going to come home. But, and they would be like, what are you doing? I'd say, he's going to, and I would tell Granny, he's going to run out and he's going to have a man, he's going to carry a man. And about this time, here comes this guy carrying a man. And back then, they didn't do reruns of the news. Granny understood. I would say stuff like, I think somebody's coming. I think I better do something. And we would go and we would be doing something. I'd say, buy some extra bread or get some, and little things, and they'd listen to me. But can I tell you what was also in our family? The occult. It's, I'm going to tell you right now that there's people that are, in, that, are, that are involved in the occult and the psychic world because the church didn't know what to do with them. They'd say there's people in mental institutions right now because the church didn't know what to do with them and they thought they were crazy because they heard a voice. Can I tell you, you're not crazy when you hear the voice of God. If it gives God glory, guess what? It's his voice. The devil ain't coming to give God glory. I never ever had the unction to go up and prophesy to somebody when I was out partying. Thank you. I'm going to be honest. We're going to be real honest and, get, and it's going to be raw. We're going to get down to the root of a thing. Because here's the thing about, pro about prophecy. Most prophecy, if it has, you know, it talks about now is the ax laid to the root of the tree. That's just not about revealing things in scripture and showing stuff. It also works with prophecy. Most of the time when somebody comes up to you and gives you a word that's very personal, it's laying the ax to the root of the tree. Let me reveal a thing. Let me show something. It's because we have to understand that you were created with the power to go back into the root. Because see, if Satan can come when you're little and bring something, Something that perverts your eye and perverts your hearing. Let me tell you something, and don't raise your hand on this. Most of you in this room have saw and heard wrong things. A lot of the prophets that I come up against have to battle things like entertainment with movies, books, things that are not of God. Let me tell you something else. Prophets are affected. If you're a seer, there was, while you were little, I guarantee that any kind of dirt and filth started coming up before your eyes. Because, say, you're, listen, God's bragging on you in heaven long before what your purpose is is realized on the earth. And if Satan can bring and the enemy can bring something to distract you and to destroy you that you don't embrace what God's going to show you. I've met many prophets, and you know what some of their hardest strongholds are? Pornography. Because they were created to see the things of God, but instead of seeing the things of God, they're seeing the filth of the world. See, because Satan's whole agenda is to pervert purpose. So if he can make somebody who's a prophet think that they're a psychic and they can charge money for the gifts and callings of God that are without repentance and they can pervert their purpose, then Satan is one. Because what happens is they stop looking for the one that created them and they start wanting to be, they, they start worshiping the gift that's in them. That's what it talks about in Romans 1 when it says and they, they, they didn't want to have the worship of the creator. There's so much that we got to understand. There is a battle for your purpose. There is a battle over your words. There's a battle over what you're going to see. There's a battle over what you're going to say. Listen, God's, they're all of, command me, ye, me according to my word. Psalm 103, 20, who knows it? Ye angels which respond to the voice of the word. Come on. You know why everybody's so wrapped up in angels? Because they finally realize they're there. That is exactly it. The word that you speak, when you put this word in your mouth, it becomes a kingdom seed. Just like a seed that you put in the ground contains everything it needs to grow when it's in the right atmosphere to push itself out and become the plant that it was always intended to be. These words contain the power to bring them out. That means that the word itself, when you speak God's word into any situation that he is showing you, speak it into a person, speak it into anything, whether it was living, you have dominion. Speak a word in power, speak a word in dominion, and then guess what? That word that he watches over it to perform it, it means that if it has the power in that word to draw an angel, to become the messenger, to go forth and deliver that word, all you have to do is speak the word in the right word at the right time. And you can see something birth, something born. 
We're getting ready to explore what it means to have a prophetic womb. Do you know that you're like the prophetic womb of God? That's why you're called the bride of Christ. Every woman has a womb. That's why us, we are sons of God, that we manifest and we redeem creation. You're also men and women, the bride of Christ, and you have a womb. That means that you can conceive things, you can nurture them and give birth to them. That means you've got to start seeing stuff not just in the physical, but in the spiritual aspect. You've, that's why I said to a prophet, everything is, a, is, is about prophetic. That's why when, it, when you see a storm, you better know from where the source of that storm comes from. See, I was watching these storms that came up today. What creates a storm? It's when something hot and something cold meets. Did you hear all the thunder that we had first? God said that when two opposing forces meet, there's going to be created a whole lot of noise. Have you been hearing a lot of noise yet when, the un when two different forces start coming together? Listen, the kingdom of heaven belonged to the violent. The violent take it by force. You're going to have to yell. You're going to have to sing. You're going to have to praise. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to start not just looking for a sign, but be in a, a sign. See, Isaiah was told, go be naked. How many of you want that word? <laughs> Come on, let's be truthful. Amen, sister. But let me tell you something. He was, listen, they were getting ready to go to war and they thought they had everything covered. He shows up uncovered. He lays down 365 on one side for Israel, turns over for 45 days for Judah on the other side, talks to him about cooking his food with the waste, human waste. That's incredible to me. See, and we think that that's all Old Testament. Let me tell you what New Testament looks like. How many of you know who Agabus is? One, two. In the book of Acts, Paul, three. <laughs> Got to love the man up high, amen? That's prophetic right there. When you see, when you see, I just, I was, oh gosh, that's, that's prophetic. You're, you're, you're a man going up higher into a high place, positioned to see great things. Whew, holy ghost. But anyhow, Agabus encountered Paul. He was a prophet. He took Paul's girdle. He tied his own hands up. He said, you see this? He said that if you, the man that does, that this girdle belongs to, if he goes into Jerusalem and he goes into Rome, he's going to die. This is how you'll be led. See, a lot of times we don't realize that prophecy surrounds us every day. We've got to know that not just Jesus Christ. Do you understand he had the spirit of the Lord on him? And yet Paul was fully persuaded because he knew his purpose. Some prophetic words that you get are just to make you aware of situations. It's not to deter you. It's not to stop you. Some things are just brought up to make you aware. That's why I talked about how many of you can walk in a room and tell me, like, where the, like you're there five minutes and you know where the bathroom is and you know that there was a blue couch and you know that there was uh, over there in the cafe was closed in the bookstore, but there's t-shirts outside. And like you can look and as you pull in, you look over and you know where everybody's car is and you see things. You see, that's because the Lord has given you sharp senses. You got to start developing the gifts that's inside of you. Asked you to show you. How many of you are dreamers in here? Okay, I decree and declare that most of you in here are dreamers and don't know it. We're going to talk about when God prophetically speaks in the night season. We're going to go in prophetic dreams, visions. We're going to start talking about not just what you hear, but what you see. I want you to, that notebook I gave you, I want you to start, if it's not that one, get you another one. Put it by your bed. How do you, because let me tell you something, I've just been getting a lot of dreams lately. I normally am a visionary or a seer and a hearer more than I'm a dreamer. But because I've been, as I've been praying and really seeking God in this, I say, God, because I'm really, I mean, I'm just now starting to explore what God's talking about when he says, you know, if, if it, pastor says it all the time here, that if it's attainable, let's go after it. If it's available, let's go after it. So, okay, the bottom line is, is God's showing me that there's a way that I can dream with God to create what in my, it's almost like a God conscious is what I'm going to call it is that I become aware of him in my night's sleep so that when he works out things through dreams and visions, that in the next day I go to him first thing in the morning with success strategy to, break, to get that from heaven, to bring it forth in the earth. I was dreaming the other night that God was giving me some end time things. 
and I was seeing this big factory. And we, it was up on a hill, and I knew I was dreaming. You ever know you're dreaming? But it seemed so real. And so I saw this huge factory, and these trucks kept coming in, and then they would and they'd be full, loaded up. I mean, riding low, tarps, because i got a man that does construction. I know what that looks like. So I'm thinking, man, there's loads of stuff. And, and behind there, there was just all this, like, building going on. But it was in this compound. And at the base of this compound, here's this poverty in cities and people that were just didn't have anything to do. And we're driving by, and I see all these people not doing anything. And they're looking, in, they're looking up at that big building. And then I realize we get up there, and there's a fence. And we come up to the place where the fence is missing a part, and we realize there's a breach in the fence. So if we can't get into the door, we'll go around the side. We get out, and we think that nobody notices that we're there because we look like them, and we, we, we all, I look down, and I'm wearing what they're wearing, but they know that we're different. And so I'm standing in the middle of this place, and I walk in, and I see all this stuff, and I keep watching these trucks. And everywhere that I stood in this place, I could see the city that was below. And I could even see the people that were waiting and looking with expectation up at this place. And I walked over to the one girl there, and I was like, man, I said, you guys must be really helping this out. I said, you know, this is a really prosperous place. I said, you know, you think it's going to affect the, the economy of the city? She said, no, why should it? And I said, well, don't you, you know, reach out there and, and have jobs there? And she just looked at me so strange. And then I was realizing something that for a place of great industry, and if you come to our house or here at the church, you'll realize that the phone rings nonstop. And in this dream, the phone wasn't ringing. And so I'm sitting there and I begin to really pay attention to this. And I said, oh my God, they're preppers. And I went to the front of the building and it said, church. And God showed me that they were preparing for the end and not for now. And they were storing up and not reaching out. And I got up that morning and I began to cry and to weep and to wail. And you know, I said, God, forgive us because we've seen needs that we refuse to touch. And we're in a high place and we refuse to reach low. And even from what my dream was, I woke up crying and I realized that there was no noise going in and out and the phones weren't ringing because they had made it a business about being a business. And I'm not talking about Harvest Chapel. I am talking about the church. We're not talking about a place. We're talking about a church. And a lot of you have been getting dreams about the church. Some of you have been seeing some things. I saw that the bride that refused to get dressed. I had a dream about a little girl playing in a wedding dress. Nobody takes a brand new wedding dress and lets a child play in it. And this little girl kept trying to get this dress on. And it was too big. And she's doing this in the mirror. I look pretty. I look pretty. God said it's time to grow up. Because the bride will have to make herself ready. And when you begin to understand that we're in the process of growing up. And God said don't be grieved because she's playing. Celebrate the fact that she's growing up. See, my focus would have been one way. God's changing my focus through dreams. He's changing my focus through vision. We were at a place called When the Prof Let the Prophet Speak. We have just been at this conference. And they had just begun singing in these incredible worships. It was just dun, 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 dun. And they were playing this like trumpet blast. With, with like a synthesizer behind it. But all I heard was dun, dun, dun. And the, about this time, this girl, her name's Jasmine. What is it about a Jasmine? We're going to just props. But she started singing this little song. Um, Drop your skirt and release the name. Drop your skirt and release the name. Draw me close. I want to read the name on your thigh. And if anybody knows that, that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the end time as he rides the horse, it's as that upon his thigh is written his name. And then she started singing, drop your skirt and cover me. Drop your skirt and cover me, redeem me. Lord, I'm redeemed. And she started singing about all about being redeemed and covered. And she started singing and all of a sudden, I began to have open vision. I'm on the floor under a pew. And all I saw was blood all over my face. And it looked like I was having a bloody nose and it was gouts and gouts of blood. 
See, be careful when you start wishing for vision. You might not like what you get. Not all of them's pretty. Some of them's beautiful. You'll get gardens and angels and all kinds of good stuff. But me, I get blood, guts, and gore. Okay? That's where I guess I was at that week. Can I tell you as a prophet that where you, are, where you stand is what you see? And what you see is what you say. So if you're in a bad state, you're emotional, you're up and down, that's how you're going to prophesy. Up and down, emotional. Listen. But I was in that place, and I was actually very happy that day. I don't know why it went that place. And I was like, God, what are you trying to show me? And I'm on the floor crying, and in this vision, I'm catching this blood. I'm going like this because I was scared. I, was, I didn't want to mess up the clothes. And then people were coming trying to get towels and wipe it away. And I began to say, no, stop. And I'm rubbing this blood all in. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't me any longer. It was Jesus, and it was the blood-covered man. And he said, I paid the price. My blood's redeemed you. And my blood has covered you and you look like me. So I had a new vision of myself covered in God's blood. And it started one way and turned another. You got to understand visions. If you push them away, they'll go away. I could have got nervous and upset and didn't. I've learned. Let the vision play out. Stay in prayer. Don't rush out away from what God's trying to show you. If you've got a scripture that every time you turn around keeps coming up. Have you ever opened your Bible every day and it falls to the same place? Read it. It's a good book. God's talking. There's little things like this that we're going to learn about. We have to be sensitive to the Spirit of God. See, I never used to get a whole lot of visions. Like every time I look at Brandon, I see a globe behind his I guess it's your left shoulder. Yeah, your left shoulder. It's my right, but your left. Spinning. God show me he's been around the world and he's getting ready to go again. Probably not what he really wants to hear right now. But see, God shows me things because I ask God to show me things. Make sense of it all. How many of you have ever said, make sense of it all, Lord? What are you showing me? You're going to learn. You're going to learn prophetic acts. I talked about when my husband was out drinking and doping. I said this in the school and it bears repeating. I would go home and I said, God, I need his kingdom strategy. I need to change the way that man walks. God said, move the furniture. Shift something. You want to shift? Shift something. You want your house to change? Change something. How many of you know that in your living room, if you leave your furniture the same way, you have what? A traffic pattern, right? So if you put the chair in the middle of the floor, everybody got to walk around it. You change the way someone walks. Don't be turning. Yeah, listen, you come visit Lisa, you better flip the light on. Because you might go to bed one way and something will be different the next way. <laughs> and I joked with it, but you know what? When I began to understand that I, through godly conversation, see, God taught me how to talk so that I could bring my husband into the kingdom and speak him into his purpose. I didn't say, you drunken bum, where have you been all night? I began to say, man of God, how did you like your eggs? Would you like me to bring that back to you? My cousin, I'll never forget it, she used to work for our company. She watched me take two pieces of toast and two cups of tea down the hall. Serve him. I go back to the kitchen, get two more. Give me two more. Now, he'd been out all night. She said, I can't believe you. What are you doing? I said, getting the husband I was promised by God to get. She said, wow, how is that helping anything? She said, all I see is you being stupid. And she was in my kitchen. She said, let me tell you something. You need to quit. You need to take half his money. You need to just let him work and pay you out of money. You don't have to put up with this, and God will use you. <laughs> she said, now you know what God, and I said, but that's not God. I said, I married that man. I said, and I had a promise from God. Listen, don't be weary in well-doing. If God's told you he's going to do something, you can count on it that he's going to do it. See, this ain't the woo, 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 Holy Ghost. No, you need to hear this is the Holy Ghost. This is what it looks like when you walk after the things of God, when you have to go do things different and you have to root up and tear down so that you can build and you can plant. See, what did I do? I rooted up what his perception of women was. I rooted up what the devil thought, what was telling him, well, you know you're going to go home to a fight. He told me years later, he'd say, I'd steal myself because you was a big chick and I thought if you hit me, I was going down. 
But instead, instead of this knuckle sandwich, he got Holy Ghost. But I had to hear from the Holy Ghost to give the Holy Ghost. I had to receive from heaven to give heaven. See, I had to learn to become what God was creating me to be. I'm going to, I'm going to share some stuff with you. This is so good to me. I'm so glad that you come and enjoy it. How many of you are enjoying this? How many of you are learning something? We're going to catch up. We are going to catch up. How many of you know that there's so many different ways to hear from God? I was writing some of this down, and God was talking to me about practical prophetics. One of the things that I do in practical prophetics is what I do with my husband. Shift furniture. Park your car different. When my son was out doing the same thing. See, let me tell you something. If I knew prophetically that I could have rooted it out all the way back generationally, I would have. My son went in the same path as dad did. Drinking and drugs. Running women. If I'd have known that this power to speak the future could have been released then, I'd have saved not only my son, but myself a lot of sleepless nights. I learned. Listen. I'm here to pour out the benefit of my experience on you so that you never have to go through it. And if I pour it into you, that means that you become the repository of the knowledge of God. And then when you are sent into any situation, guess what? You pour it out too. And when we begin to all be poured out, we begin to look like a drink offering. We begin to look like something that's going to meet something that looks just like God. That when they have an issue and they have a problem and they have a circumstance and a situation, they're going to find out they don't need an attorney. All they need is prayer and a prophet. Woo-woo, Holy Ghost. I'm telling you what, that's what, that's, we are the answer. Do you understand where the answer? The answer for everything is getting ready to come out of the church. It's getting ready to come out of the bride. She is full of kingdom creative ideas. God is speaking to her. God is speaking to you. I want you to understand how God's speaking. I jotted down about, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 ways that I know that God's talking. And the first thing was numbers. I said it about like the 333 and the 444. How many of you know what prophetic numbers are? Well, guess what? One of your books that you're getting is going to be a prophetic dictionary, a prophet's dictionary. And it's going to contain words, numbers, what they mean. Listen, it's not the end all, but it's a guide. How many of you have ever bowled with bumpers? Come on. You're, you've seen it. At least you've been to the bowling alley and seen it. Okay, I'm going to put it that way. Some of you is pros in here. Dave is the Mr. 300 game. He, but yeah, see, he's, he put it in, yep, I'm shy, but no, you're the, we, we bold with you, Dave. <laughs> but trust me. But here's the thing about going prophetically. This class is not the thing. It's not, it's all about rolling with bumpers. This class and these books are a guide. They keep you out of the gutter. They keep your ball in the lane so that you can hit the pin. That's all this is about. It's not the thing. That's why I said I'm not here to teach you to prophesy. I'm here to give you tools so that when God causes you to speak, that you can take what God has given you and begin to pour it out. And you're going to know your purpose. You're going to know your function. You're going to know what's God, what's not God. You're going to not have to question, and you're not going to miss your opportunities. Because how many of you know opportunities come to you every day to be God? And when I say to be God, guess what? If God's in you and you're showing up in him, that means that you're called to be God in any given situation. You're called to bring a life into a dead place. You're called to speak. You're called to walk and talk and create with God. You were created to be God in this earth. You got to get it through your head. When we talk about little G, how many of you heard little G theology and it made you offended? Have you, did you get offended on it? See, I had to learn it because the school that I come with from the old school, how dare you think that you're God? God's holy. You can't talk for God. Why can't I? That was the biggest lie from the devil is he got religious and told us what we couldn't be like God. See, I think that we have to understand that we were created not just in his image, but that we were created to do what he says to do because he's enabled us with himself to do it. So when you show up, that means that God has got it for you. That's like prophetic numbers. When you understand you start seeing ones, it can mean unity. If it starts showing up as 11s, so you have to know the difference. Are you getting three ones? Is it one, one, one? And God's showing you unity and unity and unity. Or is he showing you 11 plus one? And he's giving you a 12 and something. 12 is the number of governments. You're going to learn what that means. How many of you know that colors are prophetic? God's going to start showing a whole bunch of you colors. 
Some of you look at people, the world says it this way. How many times have you heard somebody that's psychic, quote unquote, I'm just going to throw that up there like my hubby does, but they'll say, well, I see auras. I see colors around people. They ain't seeing colors around people. They're seeing the spirit around them. See, and they don't even understand it. There's a time where a lot of you are drawn to certain things, and every time you go to pray, you start seeing rainbows. How many of you have seen green? How many of you have seen rainbows? Because God says that he sits on a throne of sapphire and there's emeralds there and all of a sudden you see rainbows and God's getting ready to give you visions of his throne. If you'd stay a little longer, pray a little longer, worship a little harder, you're going to slide right into the throne room and begin to see the very throne of God. I've been seeing incredible stuff. You know where it talks about, I don't know if a man, he was in the body or out of the body, and Paul talks about being caught up. There's a whole bunch of you in this place that are getting ready to be caught up to see things you never thought that you'd see. <sighs> My God. Some of you are going to look at people, and you're going to know it's cancer. And what kind? And you're not even going to have a medical background, and you're going to be able to look at them and go, yeah, that's Hodgkin's lymphoma. That's melanoma. You know, that's none. What, you know, like all these, med I don't know any medical terms really. I don't. I just know what God shows me. When you see that somebody has trochantrical bursitis and has leg pain. When you realize that they have a meniscus and a patella. And you learn names that you never looked at. I've had to go look up names. How many of you have had a word dropped in your spirit, don't know what it is and have to go find a dictionary? Or there's Google and God. I'm no longer stupid. I go to God first and then I got to Google. God sends me to Google. And I'm hoping for a spelling. So when it pops up, I'm like, yeah, that might be it. Because I don't even know what they mean. But this is some of the ways that God's been talking to me about practical prophetics. And I call it God speaking. Numbers. Colors. How many of you are perceptive? You get around somebody else and you know when somebody's really depressed. They could be smiling. See, feeler. Perceptions. That's one of the ways that what you perceive, what you see, you're seeing beyond what they're showing you. That's one of the greatest gifts that a prophet will ever have is they will see beyond what is evident into what is spiritual. How many of you have ever felt touched by the hand of God? Nobody's there, but you know it, and you can feel it, and it's weighty, and it's laying on you, and it's almost like a pressure. How many of you have ever been worship, and you feel like hands on your shoulder or your head, and you'll open up, and there ain't nobody touching you? How many of you have had God grab your feet? Have you ever been praying and feel somebody, something grab your ankles? <sighs> have you ever felt God's hand in your hair? I'm telling you, some of you are getting ready to experience some amazing stuff. Audible voice. Who's heard the audible voice of God? First time I heard it, I was 19 years old. Second time I heard it, it came with instructions in unusual places. Listen, not everything that rumbles is thunder. Sometimes it's God talking. Have your ear tuned to what he says. And if you think your ear's dull, listen, we're going to spiritually clean it out. Have you ever had your own voice speak something that you didn't mean to say, but you said it anyway? Just fell out. I think that just might have been the Holy Ghost. Because if you had thought about it, you wouldn't have said it. See, God gives his, gives your, uses your voice, but it's his thoughts. I love that. Um, have you ever seen pictures? Like you go somewhere and God will show you pictures. You'll see something and it's, it's a type of vision, but it's vision with memory that you'll see a picture that will remind you of something. And then God brings somebody to you and you begin to minister from it. Like you're standing maybe at Red Lobster and you're looking at a picture of sailboats and you're going, man, that, you know, I'd love to go to Maine. And the person beside of you is from Maine. And all of a sudden, you've got the entrance for the Holy Ghost to come in and begin a conversation. See, he uses pictures to touch. Have you ever smelled something? Like I said earlier, smelled things. How many of you have smelled God? The garden of God. How many of you smelled the stink of demons? See, not everybody does that. It's not a fun one. 
I've walked into a place before, it smelled like open sewer. And I'm looking around to see what's rotten. And everybody was dressed up and looked pretty. I was the worst dressed one in there. I was sure that I had took a bath. They looked like they did too. And I kept smelling this and smelling this and smelling this. And I'm telling you, that woman was so ate up with cancer that the demons of death were hanging on her. I prayed over her and I, I felt that smell change. I felt it and I smelled it. And all of a sudden, what used to stink, all of a sudden, I just started smelling roses. And nobody handed that woman a Tic Tac. There's nothing but God. Get ready, you're going to see some unusual stuff. How about nature? How many times have God had you look at something in nature? He'll show you a tree. He'll show you a sunset. He'll show you rainbows. He'll show you a blade of grass. He'll show you a bunny. He'll show you something and begin to talk to you about it. How many of you have watched geese fly and realized that they pointed in a direction? And God said, you know what? Maybe we need to get some migratory and anointing, that we need to go somewhere being led by something. And what I loved about geese, God said, watch them long enough. And I was watching this set of geese, and I was actually driving down to my grandmother's from Pennsylvania, Maryland. There's an old reservoir or, or dam out there, a long arm, and they like to the nest there. Well, they were just kind of flying, and then when one would get tired... And he dropped back and another one would swoop up and take his place. He said, you notice they ain't jealous and fighting for the lead? Amen. God will talk to you about things in nature. He'll use something nature to show you something spiritual. Because see, here's what we understand. That nature declares his glory. When we look at the universe, it declares his creative ability and his power. So if a blade of grass can speak to you in the intricacy because God said, pick it up. Remember when, I don't know, see, I'm, a, I'm, I'm country. So you put the piece of glass between your fingers and you blow and it'd make a whistle. God said even grass has a sound. See, that's country. I'm this, that's biscuit and gravy country. But God began to talk to me about that even grass when held in the right way creates a sound. So if a created thing held in the right way, breathed on, will release something into an atmosphere that was never there before. See, he showed me a plant. I got a plant called a long neck goose strife. If you have something with strife in the name, you should know not to receive it. My neighbor come over because I said, oh my gosh, those white flowers are beautiful. Where did you get? Oh, here, you can have some. <laughs> should have Googled that. They were a weed. Weeds are invasive. I put that thing in my garden. The first year it was beautiful. Oh, look at that. It's this long green plant grows like this and a hole underneath is white bell flowers. These things were gorgeous, about yay tall. Next year, had double. I thought, well, praise God, that's pretty. <laughs> Every one of them little white flowers was a seed and that thing was a weed, it wasn't a flower at all. Weeds are invasive. Do you know that one thing that I planted in my garden finally took me almost seven years to root out? And finally, after I dug the dirt up, because it got to that I couldn't get all of them, I finally just dug the dirt up and went and bought new topsoil. You know what God said? Be careful what you plant in your garden. It just might grow. And it took very little effort to plant it and a whole lot of effort to dig it up. Let me run through these quicker. I like that. That's a good sign. Up and down lights. Don't you love that? Highlights. When God begins to put a light on something, you ever seen something when God, you'll be driving and the sign that you passed 75 times before didn't show you nothing. And all of a sudden, every time you pass it, you see it more and more and more. The highlights of God, it's like God puts a great big spotlight on something or somebody. Have you ever watched somebody that every time you see them, it's just like you just have to hug them? I'm a hugger, so that's like my deal. Can I tell you that I see the love of God? It's like a highlight on them. There's certain people, every, I'm telling you, that they are just, it just sets me off. I'm like, yes, Holy Ghost, they're so good. The Holy Ghost prompts, it's a divine push to do something. How many of you ever had that where it won't leave you alone? Go to your neighbor, go to your neighbor. You got to make that phone call, got to make that phone call. Why don't you call them? How about you see them? And somebody will even call their name and you didn't even think about them. How many of you have done prophetic acts? You've picked up the phone and, no, and, and they were on the other line and it never rang. 
So I'm seeing a bunch of hands around here. This is good. How about people that come into your life, saved and unsaved? Doesn't matter who they are, but they keep reoccurring in your life. Everywhere you go, you run into them. You go to Walmart, they're there. You go to the grocery store, they're there. And then you think, well, that's, you know, Hannah ain't that big. It ain't that big of a deal. But then you start going to York, they're there. And if you go down to the mall down in Towson, they're there. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, this is a divine encounter. I need to pay attention. That's the Holy Ghost giving you a highlight with people. And he's putting people in front of you. There's visions. We touched on visions. We touched on dreams. How about entertainment movies? You know, I was looking at movies lately, and I really like to be entertained. I hate to say that, but it's the truth. I'm a big movie watcher. I love to watch a story unfold. Uh, I really do. I love to, I love to see the creative process. The other day I was watching this thing called The Stranger. It was on TBN. It was this movie about this girl that was encountering, uh, it, was, it turned out to be Jesus, but she encountered a stranger all the time and he kept stepping in and out of her life. And she, he was always there. And there's one, there's another one where they sit down at dinner and he begins to talk to her and he reveals that he was the Lord and he'd been there all along. So I love how movies unfold. But here's what God's been showing me. Even in earthly movies, if you've watched, there's been a subtle shifting into the evil the paranormal and the occult movies even the commercials make me feel sick there is this commercial is it a paranormal act what, what it's the one where the woman grabs the thing and pulls her up to the ceiling did you see that commercial oh holy ghost it makes you want to sell your tv it's just bad. I mean, there's, and then this other one comes out, they look all crazy and demon possessed. But lately, if you notice, the, the theme for a lot of teenage movies right now is possession. Listen, the same way God knows that they're his and has claimed them, the enemy wants to possess them and possess their future and kill, steal, and destroy. We've got to understand that the same way God can speak through movies, so can Satan. So listen, we've got to be prophetic about every movie that we see, every song that we hear. Um, we're going to uh, understand there, even in the word. And this is what I think is amazing. Uh, how many times have you encountered certain words out of the Bible? Over and over. My husband, years ago, for when he first got saved, would do this, God, I need an answer. Yay. And he'd go, the Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. Okay, I'm feeling mighty today. And this would be his word for the day. You know, he'd be like, okay, God, should I pay the bill? Should I pay the bill? Should I pay the bill? So they did eat and were filled. <laughs> I promise you, that's what I just touched. <laughs> okay, I'll pay that one. Yes, God. Now, that was an immaturity, but the word does talk. How many of you know that, how many of you get the daily devotional on your smartphone? And I know I'm over time, but I'm going to hurry up. But um, how many of you get that daily devotional or have the little thing? How many times has that word meant something to you? You've read it in the morning and by afternoon it's ministered to you so much and it became a fresh word in your life. How many of you know, like I use Facebook. I believe that God says redeeming social media, that I'm not going to let the devil have it. There is no way. And a lot of you, I enjoy everything that you post on there. Keep it up. We encourage one another. Because if, cause listen, we are bombarded with media. We need to take back media. One of the greatest places that we're going to see our prophetic voice in the next six months is going to be in media. There is going to be a push that God is going to, I mean, we're going to see a God voice coming out of social media. We're going to see uh, things where like it'll say how many likes. Everything that's with God is going to get millions and millions and millions and millions of likes the same way. Listen, and there was this girl on TV, and I'm not even going to say her name, but she was dancing kind of not good, and everybody was talking about it. The same way they knew her name the next day, they're going to know the name of our God. They're going to know the name of his move. They're going to understand that God's getting ready to step into sectors and business and arena and go into educational systems, and we're going to see the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdoms of our God, and it's going to show up on CNN, not just on TBN. Come on. Woo, you can clap. That's good. Holy Ghost. How about angels? Angelic encounters. God's been really dealing with me about the fact that we've, 
we've become a culture that even will push it away as being flaky and not, we don't, we, we misunderstand their purpose. He says, are not all my angels ministers? We've got to understand that they were created to minister. When you minister something, that means you can administer something. Pastor Lori, one of her greatest gifts is administration. That means she makes sure that things that need to get done, get done. My God, that's a ministry in itself. The prophetic is going to start walking in the practical. You're going to start going into your job. Wisdom is getting ready to be released. How many of you know wisdom is a precious commodity? See, God's going to start talking through unusual things. God's going to start talking through signs. He's going to start showing you things and having you to be things. You know what? I have a friend who was told to put on a purple coat, and it was in like September, and she was told to go stand on a street corner in East Berlin and wait, and God would tell her what to do. Well, when I heard this story, I thought, isn't that funny? And yet there was somebody that came along and said, God told me that I was going to see a woman wearing a purple coat today. She said, I'm glad you finally got here because I'm sweating, it's warm. And so they had this really great conversation. Come to find out is that he was new to the area and he needed some information. Well, by the time she got him hooked up, she got him hooked up in the right church and the one that he said he was getting ready to go to, that wasn't where he belonged at all. It messed him up. See, listen, God can position you. You can be the sign that God wants to use. Can I tell you that we're going to do the incredible in here? For this first class, I'm going to tell you, I thank you so much for coming out. You're going to start seeing and doing things. We're not going to go in. One of the things that you'll hear in Harvest Chapel, if you're around any time at all, what are you hearing from God? Starting out to next, next Thursday's class, I'm going to ask you, what are you seeing with God? Not just what are you hearing from God, but what are you seeing from God? Because it's important for us to understand that God wants us to do more than just here. We're going we're gonna to plug in the senses. What are you dreaming with God? What's God showing you? Some of you are going to be assigned just because you're going to go and do something for someone else. See, I love the fact that we can be kingdom creative. You want to change somebody's walk? Maybe some of you might need to just go buy somebody a pair of tennis shoes. Put some anointing on them and pray over them and say, God, the footsteps of the righteous man are ordered by the Lord. And go give them a pair of anointed shoes to put on their feet. And all of a sudden, because here's what we neglect to do. In John it says this, whose sins you remit, they're remitted. And whose sins you retain, they're retained. So when we learn how to remit sins and retain grace and call things as though they are not as though they are. Listen, I can look at somebody in a destructive pathway and begin to call their destiny to them and give them a Holy Ghost shove in that direction. You can be the sign that God wants to use. God's raising up your prophetic voice. My thing for you this week is that every night I want you to lay with a journal by your head. I want you to go to bed with it when you're praying, whatever God begins to give you. We're going to start going in one-on-one. Next week, we're going to go into numbers. We're going to go into colors. We're going to go into dreams. We're going to go into visions. And it's not about what I've done. It's about what God's doing with you. We're going to push, pull, scream, tug. Some of you are going to go kicking and screaming into the prophetic. Because let me tell you something. Like I said, be careful what you, what you desire. You might get it. God says if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. You're going to have your heart's desires realized. A lot of you understand that you're a prophet. You see things. You do things. It's going to be refined. It's going to be honed. Can I tell you right now, a lot of you are going through hell. Just like that. I'm going to say it. Nothing you did. It's an enemy device to destroy you. I said, it, or I said it last night when I was ministering. I felt like a special closet in hell had been opened. And they released some things they had saved up for the holidays for this week. They just left it loose. And you're battling more than ever before. It's because God's getting ready to do an amazing thing in your life. And whenever God's bragging in heaven, all of hell's fighting in the earth. Understand that God is giving you direction. God is opening doors. You're going to start seeing things you never thought you'd see before. I mean, I probably gave you, I don't know how many was in that list, but I was just pushing them out there. I'm going to, get, I'm going to, I'm going to have that whole list typed up for you. I'm going to make sure that, and I'll leave room for you to add more. I want you to see the different ways. How about the animal kingdom? How about how God will show you animals? God will show you, I mean, even things out of place. Have you ever walked in and saw somebody parked wrong? 
and all you, we've done is complain. We've been like, watch them. They just took up two places. They must think they're that the, uh -uh. God's showing you a life out of order. And maybe instead of running into Walmart, maybe you ought to just sit there against their car and wait for them to come out. And tell them God sent you. See, some of you have even done something. You've been the hand of God. There's been a young girl or a young guy or an old guy. Maybe they didn't have enough money for their, for their groceries. You become the hand of God in that minute. You become the prophecy that God wants to use. You're speaking a love language into the middle of their situation that said this is what heaven looks like. All of a sudden, they get their groceries paid for, and they're like, what church did you say you go to? And instead, it wasn't just about kingdom because your prophetic word drew them to a place where kingdom and identity can be poured into them. Where they attach themselves to you because you become the mom and dad they never had. There's marriage is going to be rescued because you're going to walk in your prophetic unction. There's going to be children with the don't know which way to go, what direction to go into. And you're going to come up speaking a word. Last night I saw a young boy and I began to talk to him about videos. I said, I see you making a video, and I see you not leading people to the Lord, but leading them back to the Lord. And God showed me that he had been like um, Obed-Edom's house, about the place where the ark had been, where they had left the ark, because when Uzzah touched it, and he put forth his hand, and he died, they abandoned the ark right where it was. They said, I'm not going to touch it and leave it there. And they left it there for so long that the people had gotten comfortable with it. Can I tell you that if a lot of these kids that have grown up in a godly household, they've walked away from the Lord in their heart, but not their actions. And because they'd gotten so complacent with always being in the presence of the Lord, they no longer regarded the ark as holy. Because they went to church all their life, it didn't make a difference to them. And I began to talk to this young boy about making this video, and he started crying. He said, you know what? He said, I was talking to some friends of mine. He said, I wanted to make a video about seeing people come back to church. He's 15. And you know what his, his desire is to make movies. So I'm not going to go up to him telling him about a feature presentation, but I'm going to go back and tell him about the video that God's calling him to make and give him an idea of his destiny. I'm looking at a group of destiny seekers and the destiny pe people that, that, that understand that we're not just God chasing anymore. We're God speaking. We're God hearing. He's found us and we found him. Can you give God praise tonight in the building? <laughs> Holy Ghost. Yes. Is there any questions? Yes, woman of God. Yes, you do. We have a, come up here. Oh, come up some more. Is that good? Yeah, we're better now. All right. There you are. Okay. I have control over you. If I move down, you just come. <laughs> See, be careful who you're linked to. Yeah. Associations are everything. They mean everything. Especially in the prophetic. Yes. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's a, it's a question. Um, it's more of like, I guess, a struggle area for me. Um, my, a lot of my um, grandparents, they did a lot of witchcraft. And so sometimes when I want to do a prophetic act, um, I get... I get paused by thinking that it feel. It, I mean, I know it's not because I'm trying to be obedient to the Spirit, but sometimes that gives me pause, and I kind of have a block there just thinking about what, you know, like voodoo, and, you know, they, they have their thing that they do also, mm -hmm. and it kind of hinders me sometimes from doing what I know, like, okay, this means this. Like, I have a draw to, you know, pray on somebody's feet, but I'm like, man, that seems like it's, you know, witchcrafty, you know. So I don't, I don't know if it's a question, but it's more of like a, a block that I have where, you know, there is a counterfeit, um, there is an original, but I have a hard time moving into the prophetic acts because of that, I guess, that history, right. maybe. Okay. How many else in here has that in their history? Okay. Well, let's address it. Here's the whole thing. The because we were exposed to a power. See, there's a difference between power and authority. See, Satan has power. He just doesn't have authority. That means even though he has power, he doesn't have a right to use it in this earth realm because it belongs to us. So when you're just talking about um, the way something looks, see, the difference is, is that what they're doing becomes the power. That what they're doing, we understand that the power is not of us. The authority is not of us. It's through Christ and the Holy Spirit 
that we understand that when we do these things, then we do prophetic activations or we pray over somebody's feet or we go anoint a doorpost or we drive a stake in or we move furniture or we begin to do prophetic declarations or we hang a flag or take a flag down or we take and cut branches or sweep an altar. We're not about the thing. The thing represents the source of the message. See, if, um, like Christ Jesus, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So in the minute that he showed up at a wedding that they didn't have wine, he starts making wine. Because he understood that the Father's a creative God. So when he began to do prophetic acts, even in that, he declared who he was through his ministry. What you're doing in the spirit when you pray over someone's feet, or you pray over um, their head, or you say, give me your... Um, Say, say you have somebody hand me you their wallet. You say, I'm going to pray over your finances and we're going to lay hands, touch, and agree. You use the biblical power of the word with an unction from the Holy Spirit to decree and declare by your power and your authority and your anointing. Do you remember when Jesus gave the disciples power? He, they went out at the, by twos and he says that they came back rejoicing because even the devils, had they were subject to them and they had power over them. He says, all authority I give you. See, the thing about it is, is it's not just power, it's the authority to walk like Christ. That's what makes the difference. So when you begin to know that what you're going to do it's all about motive and it's about purpose and it's about the end. See, God is Alpha and Omega. So you understand he declares the end from the beginning. So that means that you know what the end is going to look like. So if you see someone that's crippled and you know that if you call for oil, it says that you can anoint them with oil and the prayer of the faithful shall heal the sick. Even if you're as an elder, as a believer, it says and you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You're operating with a biblical principle and you have the authority in Christ to do it, you begin to decree and declare. You're setting in motion the tools that God gave to you. We all know the scripture about that we are, have, are the weapons of our warfare aren't carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. See, that's one of the things we're going after. And it talks about everything, that knowledge that has to be pulled down that exalts itself against God. Do you understand that voodoo was, is, is, Something like if you understand about mojo and curses and things like that, it operates in the negative realm from what God's doing. It is truly a counterfeit. It doesn't mean it don't got power. There's been people that's died under voodoo. I mean, I've went to the islands. I've been in Suriname. They deal with voodoo. They have um, tribal medicine that comes out of the Amazon. Plus, they have a Hindu spirit in there. I was with a Pakistani, with the Hindustani people. They have 600 gods. And they said, well, Jesus, I'll just add another one. And I said, no, mixture is wrong. And we took them, and I took them through Leviticus, and I began to show them that anything that's mixed is weak. And I was showing them how that you don't sow two different seeds in, in the same place. And what God said, and because Jesus is the way, the only way, not a way, the way. The rest have to go. And then see, when you begin to do prophetic acts in the Lord, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm coming into agreement with heaven by what God showed me, the pattern in the earth. And even if you can't find it in Bible, you can at least find the root of it in the Bible. That's why I said the prophetic is laying the ax to the root. It shows you that those feet might, need, maybe their, their footsteps, or maybe they're going to bar. Let's say they're completely whole. And God's saying, pray over their feet, pray over their feet, pray over their feet. And you're just like, look, I've got to be obedient. I've got to pray over your feet. Well, the reason God's having you pray over their feet is maybe they're walking a divided path, that they're walking into church and they're getting filled with the Holy Ghost. But on Tuesday, they're falling into the bar room and can't come out to Friday. So they've got a divided path and God's having you pray over their feet and you're praying that, you know, God will take and make every crooked way straight and he'll break down the iron bars. And, and you begin to pray these prayers and about treasure from a secret place. Well, how do you, how, we all know that Jesus is our treasure. He's the treasure of God. It says he talks about the pearl of great price hidden in the field. You begin to pull all these scriptures together, the power of the written word. You put it in your mouth, in your prayers, and you begin to activate it scripturally and powerfully through what God's shown you, you've activated not just the rhema, but the logos. And there is a power in agreement. The logos and the rhema of God will always operate in agreement to bring forth God's purpose in the earth. That's why if God tells you to do something odd, do it. Don't just wait and say, well, God, I don't know. 
I don't know. It might be time. Because listen, if you wait long enough, how many of you know, most people say, oh, what comes around goes around. That's not always true. In God and in Christ, there's sometimes you get one opportunity. You need to seize the opportunity because I'd rather be wrong doing something for God and miss it that way than not to do anything at all. Because if you're doing it in Christ, you're not going to hurt nobody. You're going to help somebody. That's why it's important for us to begin to speak what God would have us to speak. When God wants a word and you say, you know, I just don't know if it's God. Well, will it edify? Will it lift up? Put it to the criteria of scripture. Let that be your filter. What is the purpose of this word going forth? What will it accomplish? When you understand and you begin to look at that, in the, and you have to bring kingdomize to every situation. What will the end result be? And you begin to say, what's the motive? See, that's how you can tell the pure from the, from the false a lot of times is motive. Because the false will come attached to things. It'll pull you out of purpose. It'll take you on a wrong direction. Instead of you having a single eye focused on God that your body's full of light, you get a cloudy eye. It's like having spiritual cataracts and you can't see. That's what mojo and all that voodoo stuff is. And, you know, they go to church and have a picture of Jesus on the wall, and they've tossed a mojo ball up under the couch. And for you guys that don't know about voodoo, what a mojo ball is, is they would go get your hair, they get a little piece of your clothes, and they put witchcraft stuff together in it and tie it up, speak a curse over it, and throw it in your house. They'd activate all of hell against you. And then there is really no power in the mojo ball. Where the power was was the agreement with the enemy. That's why we are the, the, we're the change agents of God. You have to understand when you show up in any situation speaking the words of God, you become God's change agent in that situation. That's why we have to not just hear from God, but we have to hear with God. It's not for us enough to speak for God. We have to speak with God. Everything we do has to be not just for the Spirit, but by the Spirit. And everything you do has to be motivated by love. Even when, like Jonah. Okay, I'm going to use him. He had eight words. He got word thrown over. He went through the whole thing. We all know the story of how he ran. But if you count it, he had eight words. And yet 40 days and none of it will be destroyed. He had eight words to speak. But he spoke them in the place he was called to speak them. And everybody turned their hearts. They rent their clothes, even down up from the king down to the smallest men. And their hearts turned to God. That was a harsh word. Destruction's going to come, but it was the right word at the right place. Two thirds of us knowing when it becomes from God is the right time in the right place. If you are in your house and you're just praying, God, just kill him. Just kill him, God. God, I'm sick of him. Just move him out of the way. God, can't you just get him safe and take him to heaven? That's not prophecy. That's you being miserable. Understand what God's saying. See, it's important for us to understand. And listen, because you have a history in that, what it does is that wants to jump on you. Don't you even understand that's the enemy trying to bring confusion? Now, you know it, and it, but you're like, and it causes you to wrestle in yourself. How many Kairos now moments have you missed because you had to convince you you just heard from God? I, I'm guilty. Like I said, in our family, because we, had, we didn't realize that the gifts that we had they weren't psychic. They were prophetic. I had an aunt who got so strung out. She was murdered. I'm just going to tell you right now. You play with the devil long enough, he will kill you. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And the only thing that we have that we hold hope into is the fact that she died such a terrible death that we knew that she had time to call out on the God that she knew of her youth. And that's where we have hope. I don't want nobody to hope I went to heaven. They ought to know I went because I lived heaven every day. I went to heaven the minute that I said, yes, Jesus, I surrender my life into yours. See, I've already, that's when I, when I received heaven. That's when I received the glory. I died with him. I'm raised with him. We live in a new place, in a resurrected place. We prophesy from that place. We are not old school prophets in here. Listen, there's an end time and there's a now time. There's, a, if you go to Revelation, there is a whore and there is a bride. And we never determined that the, the arrival of the bridegroom braced on what the whore's doing. So you can turn on CNN, you can get on anything you want to get on, but the bottom line is, I don't judge what my bridegroom is doing based on the whore. I'm his bride, and I know that when the bride has made herself ready, he's going to show up. We have went over tonight. I'm sorry. Is there any more questions? I'm here to take time. I know that, that Josh can edit this. See, I love not being live. It's so good.
Does anybody have any questions? Come on, quick, come on. You guys want to go home, don't you? Are we all done? Cut it off? You got it? Okay. Father, we, let's just pray, and we're going to end this right now. And I want to thank you guys. Father, I just thank you for this incredible time, Lord God, that we can live and learn and move and breathe and have our being in you. God, that you're teaching us to walk what it looks like to be a prophetic people. Father, you're teaching us what we need to know, what we need to hear, what we need to have. God, I thank you, Lord God, that you're tuning our ears and that you're sharpening our eyesight. Father, I thank you that even right now that you're moving us into the realms of the prophetic. You're, see, you're telling us to come up higher so that we see new things. Because we know, Lord God, that in you, that if we stay in you and stay focused in you, that we'll begin to see your kingdom come and your will be doing done in earth as it is in heaven. And it won't be just done a little bit, but it'll be done a lot. And God, we'll never have to guess again if we've heard from you because we know that you're the God that speaks to his people. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Remember to put your uh, necklaces out there and lay it on the, the, the table where you picked them up. I'm going to see you here next Tuesday. We want to encourage you to come out to intercessory pr Thursday. I'm sorry, intercessory prayer. And uh, God bless you. And I, you have a word? I do. Jasmine, this is for you.